Okay, if you'll bow your heads, we'll ask God's blessing on our study. Our great almighty God, we come to you so thankful for this beautiful world that you've given to us to live in, to enjoy. We thank you so much for the beautiful day we have here in Alaska, the sunshine, the little bit warmer temperatures. We appreciate that very much. Father, at this time, we thank you we can have this Bible study via the means of technology. We pray that it will work well. We ask that you will inspire what is covered and what all of us learn from the material. We thank you very much for the epistles of Paul. And amazingly, we're to the point where we should conclude Philippians today, and we just have another four to go in covering them. But there's a lot of material there, and we thank you for it. We pray you will inspire the teaching, inspire our hearing and our ability to learn lessons and apply it in our lives. We pray, Father, for our brethren as always. We always have those who are sick, afflicted, and suffering. We have others who are grieving and needing your comfort and your encouragement, so we pray for that. But now we, we ask your presence. We pray for your spirit to lead us and to inspire us, we thank you, we love you, we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to go ahead and just jump into it where we finished two weeks ago. We have, um, we have gotten into Philippians chapter 2, and then verse 12, likely is a memory verse that many of us, of us had. Uh, because it speaks about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But we'll, we'll pick it up right there, and we've got quite a bit to cover to uh, hopefully complete the book tonight. So, um, verse 12, Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So Paul had been there. He remember how he was in Troas and he responded to the vision, the man of Macedonia beckoning, come on over and help us. So where he ended up first was across in Philippi and worked to establish this congregation. And he had been there very likely traveling through at one other time, and he certainly wanted to go back and join them as well. But uh, each of us has the responsibility to actively pursue obedience as we strive to live worthy of the calling, the investment God has made in our lives. So true conversion involves obeying God from the heart uh, when no one else is around, no one to impress no one to be want to see what we do but uh what we're talking about here paul is not teaching salvation by works he's teaching obedience as something we do because we are the called of god salvation is and always will be god's gift we can't earn it we certainly don't deserve it and so if we ask as it says in verse 13 for it is god who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So if we are lacking, we can ask God to uh, uh, stoke the flames, to stir up the fire and to uh, ignite our zeal to be able to be desirous, to will, to obey and to live in a way that is pleasing in his eyes. Dropping down to verse 14. It says, do all things without complaining and disputing. And I'll go ahead and read forward a couple more verses. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So there he mentions the word rejoice once again, and that's an underlying theme of the book. He wants us to find a way to always rejoice. So 
we're left with the we're, we're we're told do all things willingly from the heart without grumbling and complaining but as humans we like to grumble and mumble and complain and carp and and in here let's look at some of the words involved the word become that you may become blameless uh, this indicates speaks to a process that takes place over the years of our lives uh, that you may become blameless and blameless speaks of a life that cannot be criticized due to habitual sin I mean, we all are going to make mistakes we're all going to fall short as long as we get back up and confess and ask forgiveness and then God's strength to go forward then that's not an issue but we're talking about being blameless is being free from habitual sin and harmless uh, can be translated as innocent being guileless uh, speaking uh, of a life that's pure and unadulterated then it said without fault and this means to be above reproach uh, in fact a bit of an allusion to the sacrificial system a sacrifice that was spotless and without blemish that was worthy of being offered before god and then he refers to a crooked generation and the greek word is uh, scolios and in english we have the word scoliosis which refers to a curvature of the spine and so here it refers to a world that has become crooked and twisted because they've deviated from the true path that god revealed from the beginning but he also used the word perverse and perverse carries a, a more intense meaning uh, refers to a person who has deviated to the point of becoming twisted uh, deformed distorted and yet in the midst of that god tells us we are to shine as lights in the world and certainly with his with his help with his strength that can be done so shining as lights refers to spiritual character that leads the way away from the dark culture of this world and and of course the world is only descending further and further into darkness in uh, ever ever lengthening strides <clears throat> and then uh, in verse 16 he he did not want to have run in vain or labored in vain he he looked back across his ministry and specifically there at philippi and and he he rejoiced and was uh, delighted in the godly fruit that had been produced in verses 17 and 18 paul says yes and if i am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith i am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me again we keep seeing this word rejoice or the word joy throughout this letter over and over i believe at the beginning i mentioned there were 15 different places and actually used i think five different greek words that uh, that uh, look at and, and add a little bit of an aspect to the idea of joy and rejoicing so in in the sacrificial system say with a burnt offering a drink offering was generally poured out upon it and with it being completely devoted and given to god and and Paul uses that as an analogy as he looked back his entire life since God struck him down and called him uh, was as though he was poured out upon the altar, sacrificing himself and giving and serving to the, the church at Philippi and, and all other areas where he had worked. Verses 19 through 21, it's very very uh, uh just just wonderful insight into paul and the 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 deep feelings that he had for timothy and some of the others who were his um his co-workers his fellow laborers in the in the preaching of the gospel he became very personally um attached to each of them but he speaks of 
Timothy. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. So he wanted to send someone who would get a report back to him. So Paul, again, remember he's in Rome. He's in prison at this point. He doesn't have his liberty. And he wants to know, though, how they're doing. And so he says here, verse 20, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. So he was, Timothy was such a, a kindred spirit with Paul. They, they really had here a little later, he'll talk about as a, as a son with his father. It was like a father and son relationship that had developed. And Timothy loved the churches as much as Paul did. And, and yet, it's again, it's interesting. Paul had no other assisting minister who was so much so on the same wavelength with him. Uh, because as he goes on and says in verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. So he had others who assisted him. But... Um, so many of them had personal pursuits and purposes, or maybe they were only part way into it. They had other other interests in life. But Timothy was was there uh, fully with Paul in what he was accomplish, seeking to accomplish. Verses uh, 22 through 24, continuing with what he's saying about Timothy, but you know his proven character. So when Paul came through that first time, uh, somewhere along that trip, Paul and Silas, uh, Timothy had began going with them, traveling with them. So they knew him. They knew him. You know his proven character, that as a son of his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. So uh, here again, Timothy was like literally a son of Paul, but it was only in the sense of the ministry. Um, Paul was, or excuse me, Timothy was well known for his many years of devoted service to Paul. And Paul obviously expects some type of a sentence. Uh, his, his desire was, of course, to be released. Um, so that he could then visit Philippi in person and be there with them. And then the latter part of the uh, of this chapter, he uh, speaks of Epaphroditus, who was one of them. He was from Philippi. And Epaphroditus had actually come from Philippi to Rome, delivering some of the supplies and some of the maybe financial support that Paul needed because he stuck there under house arrest in Rome. And so Epaphroditus, uh, yet, uh, let's see, verse 25, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger. So they had, Philippi had sent Epaphroditus with their gift to Paul and the one who ministered to my need. So the intention was he would stay there and support Paul and, and see to whatever needs that he has. But then he explains more, verse 26, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him and not all not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So certainly that would have been a devastating blow to Paul if he had lost this dear, close assistant. If Epaphroditus had died, it would have been just, uh, you know, here Paul is in prison and has concerns about the churches in different directions. And then if one of his trusted assistants had died, it would have been very traumatic for him. So let's see. Um, he decided to send him back. Uh, verse 28, that when you uh, see him again, you may rejoice and I'll be less sorrowful. 
Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So uh, Epaphroditus, they couldn't all come from Philippi to see Paul in Rome and serve him, but, but they sent Epaphroditus as a representative. And, and uh, as soon as they heard of Epaphroditus uh, being infirm to the point almost to death that Paul decided I better send him back home, that that would uh, cheer them up and they can all rejoice together. All right, keeping, uh, keeping on here in chapter three, we, uh, we have a, Paul will return to some warnings about false teachings. Uh, there, wherever Paul went in his ministry, he had certain ones who would hover around and they would follow around. There were, there were Jews, uh, there were others, uh, wherever Paul went here, they'd be Johnny on the spot and show up trying to thwart. So verse one, finally, now this, this indicates a transition, but we're, we're just now transitioning into the second part of the book. Um, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So Paul had warned them earlier. He's going to continue warning them. He wanted to safeguard the church. He wanted them to be on safe ground so they could stand uh, and not succumb to some of the false teachings. In verse 2, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. All right, let's dwell on these words a little bit here. Uh, in the first century, I was checking John MacArthur's um, uh, commentary on this on this chapter and this word specifically, but he mentions that in the first century there were so many stray dogs roaming the streets, scavenging for food. They were they were mangy and dirty and sometimes dangerous, but over time, the Jews being so proud of being God's people and of having God's law, being proud of all the laws they had added on top of the actual moral law of God, they began looking down on other peoples. Now, you'll remember uh, Jesus at at Shechem and speaking to the woman of Samaria at the well. And when he asked her to get him water, she was puzzled that your people have no dealings with the Samaritans. But here he's talking, Paul is talking more in general that the Jews referred to non, you know, non-Jews, non-Israelites in general, as if they were dogs, meaning the animals. And he likens the Judaizers. Now we've talked about the Judaizers a number of times in as we've covered Paul's epistles, but these were the, the Jewish groups that would follow around wherever Paul went. And Paul is teaching them, well, for instance, we'll get into circumcision here shortly, but circumcision is of the heart. It's from baptism. Physical circumcision is no longer the, the sign of the new covenant. But they would follow along wherever Paul was working, and they were trying to bring these Jewish members back into Judaism. And Judaism was not the true church or the true, true religion. And so verse... Um, well, they, they prided themselves as being workers of righteousness. And yet Paul is warning them, stay away. Then, then the word mutilation. Mutilation is, is a word that refers to physical circumcision. The Judaizers taught that as being necessary for salvation. But um, the word, Greek word translated circumcision means to cut around, referring to the process of circumcising a young male child. And physical cir circumcision was not the sign of being in the new covenant. That was of the old covenant going back to the days of Abraham. 
So in verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So this was Paul's constant battle. There were those preaching salvation by works. Now, Christian works are important. It's what we should do. We should strive to act out obedience to the law of God because we are the forgiven and called of God. But we realize it doesn't save us. Now, plenty of scriptures say that we will be in the future rewarded according to our works, but salvation is and always will be and has been a gift. God gives that. We can't work to earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. We are the circumcision. Now, by that, he means we have the true circumcision of the heart, as we have in the notes, Romans 2, verse 29. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise, now again, remember back in the Genesis account when Judah was born, his name meant praise. And so in Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, Paul used that as a play of words. Our praise doesn't come from the name Judah that we bear. Our praise comes from God and what he's doing in and through us. So our circumcision is spiritual. It is of the heart. And then this, this enables us to worship God in spirit and in truth, as Christ referred to in John 4, verse 24. Uh, emphasizes again the, the importance of rejoicing in Christ. And let's see here, verse, um, no confidence in the flesh. Well, the, the flesh would refer to the, the Jewish pride in their cir physical circumcision, as well as having descended from Abraham and, and, and then performing all these additions to God's law that they had added. But reality is nothing we do in this life will earn us salvation. It is a gift from God. Verse uh, 4, though I might have confidence in the flesh. Now, confidence in the flesh refers to works based on our own actions. So, Paul is, be, is moving toward where he's going to list some of his achievements, attainments. And if it's, if it's there on a ledger sheet, his list is a lot higher than the average Jews, the Judaizers list. And we'll see what that means here very shortly. If anyone else thinks he has more, may have more confidence in the flesh, I more so. So now he starts his list. Verse 5 circumcised the eighth day. Well, again, that harkens all the way back to Genesis 17, verse 12, a part of the covenant got established with Abraham involves the male children on the eighth day of their life. They are to be circumcised. That was the sign of the old covenant. <clears throat> so Paul obviously had, as a young um, a, a young Benjamite, actually, but but in that sense, a part of the house of Judah, he had had that when he was a little baby. <clears throat> of the stock of Israel, because all Jews are going to have will have come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Of course, Jacob had the twelve sons, one of whom was Judah but they all trace their lineage back through the basic stock of Israel. And again, they were very proud of that. However, from the very beginning, from creation, there was no Jew or Gentile. God's access, the, the access to the tree of life was open to mankind, to humanity in the form of Adam and Eve. Of the tribe of Benjamin, you know, Benjamin was the last one of the 12 sons born to Jacob. He was the specifically second son born to Jacob by Rachel. Rachel had given birth to 
to Joseph, and then sometime later she gave birth to Benjamin, and that, that, that's when she died. But those of the tribe of Benjamin remained loyal to the line of David. And when the kingdom divided after Solomon's death, they remained loyal to the throne of David, and they remained with the, the tribe of Judah. So Judah and Benjamin became the house of Judah a little later after, after Jeroboam did what he did and changing the, the festival to the eighth and may have tampered with the Sabbath. We, that's unclear in history. But a lot of the Levites came and joined with those of Judah and Benjamin. But this was the house of, house of Judah. A, he, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And so in the home Paul grew up in, they spoke Hebrew. There's a statement where he's taken captive in Acts. I think it's the beginning of chapter 22, but I didn't check that. But he asked the commander if he could speak to the audience, and he turned to them and spoke in Hebrew. So he was a, a very learned man. He had his letters. He probably spoke Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew and maybe Latin. We don't know what else. So he grew up in a home, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. And when he was speaking to King Agrippa in Acts 26, verse 5, he said, "You knew me. they knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sense of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. In another place, he calls himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So this, Paul continues with his list of achievements in the flesh. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. You know, we have that story and when we are introduced to him in the book of Acts. The clothing of those who were stoning Stephen were laid at his feet. He was there later wreaking havoc of the church. He was there going to Damascus with letters to, to take captive Christians and bring them in before the council. So no one questioned his zeal. He persecuted the church. And then concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So he lived the highest standard as far as obedience to God's law, as well as all the Jewish legal additions to it. And so no one ever accused him of being a compromiser. But now notice verse 7. Paul actually uses some terms from accounting to describe his life's journey. Verse 7, but what things were gain? to me. Now, gain comes from a, a Greek word. It's an accounting term referring to a credit or showing an increase. These I have counted loss for Christ. So loss describes a business expense or a, a debit from the account. So Paul is saying that, that all of these Jewish religious credentials that he once thought of as being his prophets, his gain, were now, he understood, actually a loss. They were in the loss column of a ledger, not the profit column. They were completely and totally worthless with respect to God's salvation, because salvation is a gift perceived by faith. Verse 8, yet indeed, I also count these things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So, so all of this, you know, this, this knowledge of Christ, this personal relationship with Christ is a far greater profit than all that he listed in verses 5 through 7. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. 
rubbish. Paul viewed all of that from the past as being garbage or as being manure because, frankly, the, the old King James translates it dung. It's re referring to animal manure. That that's He's saying all of my past, that's what it was. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Now that refers to whatever works we do apart from God. And this is the seeming righteousness produced by works of the flesh, which, which can't save us. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So uh, Isaiah 64, verse 6, just part of one verse there. Isaiah was inspired to write, All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And again, sorry, it's not a pretty picture, but filthy rags refers to the woman's menstrual cycle and the, the casting aside of a filthy rag. So our relationship with Christ is made possible when God imputes Christ's righteousness to us. And that is realized through faith, faith in the perfect atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He paid the price for our sins on the cross. And faith in, he says, through faith in Christ, we read. Faith is, is the engine that drives us to strive to live by every word of God, to obey God. But, you know, the faith for salvation is also a gift from God. As he said, when we went through the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verse 8, it's a gift from God as well. Through faith, we profess our complete dependence on and trust in Christ's righteousness, not our own. And his righteousness imparted to us leads to salvation. Okay, verses, uh, verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So the resurrection, the power of his resurrection, the resurrection of Christ was a undeniable demonstration of God's complete and total power over the physical, the spiritual worlds. Uh, Jesus had already experienced our common sufferings um, has already experienced them, but plus much more. He went through, well, like Isaiah prophesied, he'd be marred more than any man. Uh, his closest friends didn't even recognize him until he heard his voice, because the voice, the human voice, is completely distinct. But Paul said that if necessary, he was willing to give up his life in order to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he, he, he was struggling because he wanted to to achieve the resurrection from the dead when Christ returned. Now in verse 12, verse 12, Paul actually 12 through 14, he returns to the analogy that is a common analogy that he uses, and that is of a, a runner. A runner to describe a Christian's struggle, his life, his growth, his trials, and in verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So Christians have not yet reached the ultimate goal. It is still possible to neglect and lose out on a great salvation that God has for us. But we continue pressing forward. We continue to struggle with ourselves, discipline ourselves, to continue reaching out for the finish line. 
And so press on, as it mentions here, is, is comes from a Greek word used of sprinters who strain every muscle in order to reach the finish line. Finish line, I've got a typo there. We just had the Olympics. I didn't didn't really watch much of it. There's just a lot of what it has become that that is uh, not what it once was. But uh, still, it's uh, uh, highlights the human achievement and just amazing the years that those who are at the very pinnacle of their of their sport, the years of effort and training and and self-denial they would go through in order to become among the very elite of the elite and so they strained and even leaned into leaned forward into to hope to be the one to break the line verse 13 brethren i do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing i do Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of, of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul had not yet laid hold on his prize. You and I have not laid hold on our prize. But Paul was saying that like any runner, he, he for, would forget the past and press on toward the prize of victory. You know, one of Satan's greatest devices is that of guilt. And he is very adept at getting us, finding an opening in our mind to inject his guilt to where that we begin feeling, we begin dwelling back on the past and feeling guilt. But if they've been forgiven, then Paul's saying, forget them and press on, push forward. Verse 16, let us, uh, therefore let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. So Christians are to have the, the attitude of zealously pursuing the prize of being like becoming like Jesus Christ. And Paul just says, if, if any don't have the same mind, then, then ask God to open your mind so you can understand. In verse 17, as, as we're getting toward the end of this third chapter, verse 17, Paul Paul's asking those in Philippi to imitate him in, his, in their efforts of pursuing the finish line. So verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now, the Philippian members certainly had an awareness of Timothy, Epaphroditus, and others. They, well, Silas had been there with Paul. And Paul's saying, look at how they conduct themselves, how their focus is onward to the kingdom of God, and then go and do likewise. Verse 18, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who might set their mind on earthly things. So there will always be those among us who pose as being God's true servants. In reality, we find they're seeking a following after themselves. We of the Church of God do not have the best record in the world. But you know, they had the same struggles in the first century, century when Paul was writing. Jesus is the one who told us you know them by their fruits. So we look more so to what fruit is born from someone's efforts than we do from listening to their words. There's a, an old saying that says, 
talk is cheap. But it's, you know, there's no mistaking what a person does, what they are. Now, there were Judaizers, again, those who wanted them to go back into circumcision and other of the physical additions the Jews had. And they were the ones relying on their own works. They were going to fall short. There were Gnostics. We've talked about Gnostics with some of the other books, the ones that had this special knowledge and they were headed to destruction because they were trusting in human wisdom. But notice in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, the Greek word translated citizenship was used to describe a capital city, say, of a province. You know, Philippi is, is the chief city of Macedonia. But a capital city that kept the records, it kept the names of the citizens on a registry. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So Paul reminds them, your names are written in heaven. Your names are in the book of life. And when our name is registered in that sense in heaven, we, we belong to God's kingdom, the kingdom that will come and be established on earth. But the Greek word translated eagerly wait expresses the idea of waiting patiently but with great expectation of what is going to be given what is going to be what will come okay chapter four we keep we keep moving here chapter four this verse one actually and in some regards is a conclusion of his admonition from the end of chapter three uh, verse one therefore my beloved and longed for brethren you know, he really yearned to be with them in person. My joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. So that's, that's a way of telling him, I love you. Thanks for being there. But uh, the Greek word translated crown referred to this laurel wreath that was given to the athletes who won some of the, the contests of that day. But the Philippian members were the, the proof, the evidence of the success of Paul's ministry. But he tells them, stand fast. That's a Greek term describing a soldier standing at his post. The soldier on his post. There are those depending on him, relying on him to stay awake and to be watching for danger and be willing to quickly sound the, the alarm whenever danger is evident. Now he rather abruptly shifts to the topic of unity by mentioning two ladies in the congregation who weren't getting along. Yodia and Senkati, these are feminine names. I implore Euodia and I implore Syncate to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, some commentators suggest that there, there were factions and these ladies were leading factions, <laughs> factions within the, the, the church, the congregation that were opposed to each other. And Paul is reminding them, you've got to learn to get along and to love each other and to cooperate in unity with each other. Because whether it was then or whether it's now, spiritual stability in the church, it gets down to just members preferring one another, having mutual love and peace among ourselves. Verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion. Now, this apparently is a reference to an individual who is not named. Maybe it's a message to an elder or one of the leading members. But the word for companion pictures a 
a team of yoked oxen who are pulling together, plowing uh, or, or harvesting in a field. Help these women who labored with me in the gospel. You know, it's possible these women, if, if you go back and check the account, it would be in Acts chapter 16. Paul saw the, the vision, the man in Macedonia come over and help us. He goes to Philippi. And then there was this Sabbath gathering of women down at the river. And so these ladies, Euodia and Syncate, they could have been among these very women who were working together and meeting together at that time. So they helped me in the gospel with Clement also. Now we don't know anything about this, this name Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So <clears throat> names in the book of life, there's a scripture here in the notes, uh, Luke 10 verse 20, uh, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And so we want our names written in the book of life. Daniel 12 verse one, the, the latter part of that verse, mentions at that time your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book verse four rejoice in the lord always again i say rejoice so again it's one of the main themes of the book verse five let your gentleness be known to all men the lord is at hand so gentleness refers to contentment with and generosity toward others. And it can also refer to mercy or leniency with others' faults. Just a gentle person is a forbearing person who shows grace toward others. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing. You know, fret and worry indicate a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God's great power. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, may known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So gratitude, thanksgiving, these should always define our prayers to God. The peace of God is an inner calm or tranquility. Um, when we thank God for his great works, his power, his wisdom, his mercy, his forgiveness. And again, remember, peace is one of the, spirit, the fruits of God's spirit. Uh, once again, guard your hearts. That's, that's that Greek word, military term, watching over God's Peace guards, safeguards against anxiety, fear, doubt, or distress. Verses 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, we'll come back to these words in a moment. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace be with you. So, of course, whatever things are true, God's word is truth. As we can read in John 17, verse 17, thy word is truth. But he said, noble. Anything worthy of respect. Whatever things are just, so that which is right in God's eyes according to God's standards. Whatever things are pure, pure is morally clean and undefiled. Whatever things are lovely, you know, this Greek term means pleasing or amiable. If there's good report. So they're highly regarded, well thought of. But meditate on these things. I believe the King James says, think on these things. Dwell on these things. 
And remember the first part of Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. We become what we spend time thinking. And so we need to be very careful what we allow to come into our mind as far as music, um, social media, websites, television, radio. Be very careful, very discerning in what we allow to come into our mind because it does affect us. Verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So it, it's been a, a, around 10 years since Paul had first gone through there and established the congregation. And there were times when they, they, they wanted to help, but it just didn't have the opportunity. And he's commending them for that giving, serving, sharing spirit that they had. Verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need. He's saying, you know, I don't, I'm not really going hungry. I, I'm not doing, doing without. Uh, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So the word in the Greek means be self-sufficient, be satisfied. That whatever God has blessed me with, that's enough. And I'm happy. Verse 12, I know how to be abased. Well, wow, did he ever. I mean, think of the times when he was uh, uh, well, beaten with rods. He, he gives a list in one of the books. He was uh, shipwrecked. Uh, there were times when, the, well, he was dragged outside of, I think it was Lystra, and he was stoned, and they thought he was dead. But then later he stood up and went on with the ministry. So he knows how to be abased. He'd been there. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So all uh, Greek word, uh, the Greek word is uh, here as far as uh, strengthened. Uh, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means to put power in. Christ will impart the strength needed to sustain us. We need to ask. We need to yield and follow through. But he'll give us the strength to endure until the kingdom is established. Verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. So he again, commends them. They were a very giving, serving, sharing congregation. In verse, uh, verses 15 through 17, here are three business terms that he's going to use in this verse. Verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning, okay, concerning is the Greek word that means like an, uh, an account, like a a bank checking or a savings account concerning giving and receiving, but you only. This is giving and receiving refers to the expenditure, then the, the receiving, the receipts. So a faithful steward of God will keep careful records of what is received and how it is spent. Good paperwork keeps us honest. And to ask about where money was spent is not accusing anyone. We just need to be able to demonstrate here's exactly precisely where it went. So the Philippian congregation had sent support to Paul when he was in other areas of Macedonia, such as in Thessalonica. Uh, verse 16, he mentions that in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my needs. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What was most important to Paul was that the Philippians' giving was building their treasure in heaven. It was to their spiritual account. 
verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things you sent, uh, sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now remember back in the Old Testament, the sacrifices were accompanied by a fragrant aroma that rose up that was pleasing to God. With the story of the, of the flood, Genesis 8 verses 20 and the first part of verse 21, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And so Paul is likening that to the gifts the Philippians had given to Paul for his needs and that these were pleasing to God. Um, very likely they had depleted some of their own reserves, but Paul was confident God would pay them back and fill those reserves back up. It's a living law. And here in the, in the notes, we have Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And so as we give, then God has a way of giving back and more besides. And uh, for instance, in Malachi, where uh, they were robbing God and Malachi was in, talking to them about you know, bringing your tithes and offerings. And God says, see if I won't open the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing you can't receive. All right, let's go to the conclusion here, verses uh, 21 to 23. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. So those with Paul we know included Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now he also wrote the next letter, the one to, Rome, to Colossae, at about the same time. And in fact, there's some thinking that Epaphroditus may have carried also the letter to Colossae that someone else took further to, to them. But in Colossians 4, he mentions the names Tychicus, Aristarchus, Onesimus, and then this Jesus who was also called Justice, who were there with Paul in Rome at, when he wrote that letter. So it may have been quite a quite a number of people who were who were there and then he said all the saints greet you but especially especially those of caesar's household now, again we've seen this type of phrase earlier in the book and in other books uh, caesar's household uh, could include a lot of people it could include princes, uh, cooks, custodians, soldiers, accountants, and others. But he bids them, the, he says, the saints greet you. And this would include those who became members of the church before Paul arrived, uh, as well as those converted during the time of his ministry as a prisoner. Now, I'll just remind you here in Acts 2, verse 10, it mentions as far as all the different peoples who were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, one mention was visitors from Rome. So the thinking was they were there, may have been a part of that group, received God's spirit, and then went back to Rome, taking the initial seeds that led to later a church being established. And then in verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all amen so very very common conclusion to uh to paul's letters so uh okay we uh we made it to the to the conclusion and that's that's good so we'll next time be able to <clears throat> go right into the next book which is colossians we'll look at 
some of the background of that book as well as chapter one and maybe again a part of chapter two of it. So at this time I'll take the notes down 